What? Which I don't have consent with. Eleven together, right? Mm -hmm. One tip of twelve to twenty together. We're going to wait a few more minutes to see if we're going to uh, establish a quorum, then we'll get the committee uh, underway.
The Information Technology and General Services Committee will now come to order. We'll begin by um, taking up item number 27 out of order. Item number 27 is a joint report from the Mayor, Controller, City Administrative Officer, and Information Technology Agency relative to a new financial management system. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry. Um, since the last time we had met, we've been doing a significant amount of work on the FMIS project. Um, and a lot of other things, but yes, you've been many other things. <laughs> uh, however, on this particular item, we've been doing a lot of work to try and refine the scope and make sure that we can implement something that would be deliverable and really act upon some of the immediate requirements that we have. So we've been working very closely with CGI AMS, who's here today, and we received a revised proposal from them yesterday. And we met today and started to go through that with the controller's office. We'll be meeting with CGI on Monday again to start working through more of the details. So the process is, is, is in pro the process is in process. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a report today. I don't have an answer today, but we are working through this. I would say within 30 days, probably we will be very much closer to knowing exactly what the scope is, the duration, the cost, and, and all of that. 30 days, I was hoping two weeks. What's going on? There's, there's a lot to go through. The, the, the project has a significant number of hours. We want to make sure that we really understand all of the work that's in all of these hours and make sure that we know what we're signing up for as a city so that we can minimize the risk. Okay. Instead of calling it a report back, what I'd like to do, and the reason why um, I mean, you know we're pressed for time, and I, yes. I respect and appreciate the fact that you have been spending a lot of time and energy on this matter, uh, like I said, <laughs> along with a lot of other things going on. But aside from going to this committee, it's going to have to go to the budget committee as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is to get uh, a report back or more of a progress report of how you feel about where you're at and some, some perhaps you can clarify um, with a renegotiated uh, proposal, uh, how you feel about it. And then what we might be recommending in this committee at that time is that we move it forward and give you another two weeks before you get to budget, okay? So within the next two weeks, try to focus as much as you can on anticipated questions or things that you'd like to let this committee know about uh, the revised version of this contract that you've negotiated. And then uh, within the following subsequent two weeks, before it goes to budget. That way, if in fact everything pans out, you'll be able to respond to budget, letting them know everything's okay, and then we'll go ahead and send it to council after that. Okay. Okay? All so right. a progress report in the next two weeks on how it's going. You're saying you need 30 days, so um, I anticipate we'll give you 30 days throughout the legislative process before it goes to uh, whether or not it gets recommended to go to council. I anticipate, based on uh, the work that you're doing and the answers you give, uh, will hopefully uh, make progress and then within the next 30 days it'll be out of the committee process and off to council. Okay. Obviously if everything goes well and your recommendations are that we move forward, correct? Correct. Okay. All okay. Right. Thank you. So with that uh, we'll hold this in the committee uh, and get a report back in two weeks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any public comment cards on this item? We're on item number 27. I do not see any public comment cards on item 27. Public comment is now closed on item 27. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Um, with that, I'm hoping I get a quorum before I take some actions. Um, Okay, we now go out of order to items number 28, 29, and 30. Okay. 
Yes. I'm sorry, would you like to group the items? Yeah, group 28, 29, and 30. Okay. Yes. Item number 28 is a motion, Rosendahl Smith, relative to instructing the General Services Department to withhold the city owned West LA Animal Shelter from sale. Item number 12 is a motion, Rosendahl Smith, instructing the General Services Department to withhold the city owned fire station 5. And item number 30 is a motion, Rosendahl Smith, instructing the General Services Department to withhold the city owned fire station 62. Okay. Um, is there any public comment on these items? Anybody here for public comment on either items 28, 29, or 30? Seeing and hearing none, public comment is now closed on these items. With that, uh, we will we will note and file items 28, 29, and 30. Thank you. Yes. Do you have any changes? Uh, um, Councilman, I'd like to recommend that we note and file items 28 and 30 because the council has already taken um, previous actions related to the FSR and mid-year adjustments. And for item 29, we can receive and file, but add the additional instruction that GSD and CAO should report back on the possibility of a direct sale for oh. that fire station five. Okay. So we'll note and file items 28 and 30, and we will, uh, on item 29, we will receive and file and uh, ask for a report back from the CAO. Um, as well as GSD. As well as GSD. Did they indicate how long they need to report back? Um, I'd say probably 30 days. 30 days? Okay. Report back in 30 days from GSD and CAO on item number 29. Okay. Thank you. We now move to well, group items one through four. Okay. Items number one through four are reports from the Information Technology Agency relative to cable changes. Good afternoon, Councilman Cardenas, William Imperial from ITA. Items uh, one and two have to uh, relate to notices to council that uh, in mayor's office that Time Warner Cable has been granted a state uh, video TV franchise for city franchise areas A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and M. And item number two relates to the notice to Council and Mayor that Cox Communications has been granted a state video TV franchise for city franchise area N. That has to do with those two items. You have J included? I have H, I, and skip J and go to K. Actually, uh, J was not included in the notice of Council oh. and ITGS, and I included it because that's what the state video franchise has. Oh. And okay. ITA's letter had J in it as well. So J is included. It's just a misprint, I believe. Okay. Okay, we'll note that that misprint and J is included and uh, okay. With regard to, if I may, with regard to items three and four, these are notifications from Time Warner <coughs> and Cox Communications with regard to pricing changes for the areas that I just mentioned. And, and actually with regard to Cox, it, that would be area N only, but re with regard to Time Warner, it would be for B, areas B, D, J, K and M. Okay, correct. Okay, thank you thank for you. that report. Um, is there anybody here to speak on items one through four? Items one through four are now open for public comment. Seeing and hearing none, uh, items one through four, public comment is now closed. So with that, uh, we will note and file items one through four. Next, we'll take up, we'll group items 5 through 11. Items 5 through 11 are reports from the city attorney's office and resolutions regarding the destruction of obsolete records. Okay. With that, we have public comment uh, on items 5 and items 8. Joyce Dillard, please come forward, Joyce. Items five uh, is regarding to the municipal uh, sports facilities accounts, and I'm concerned. I went to the city uh, city uh, controller's office to get a response to their audit that they had with the 21 million missing, and I'm I'm concerned that 
if these records are needed for recovery, prosecution, whatever's going on with that money or a follow through audit, and I didn't get an answer yet. I went there, I called this morning, I went there before I came in here, and there's still a response pending. So things like that shouldn't go through until a huge amount of money like that is settled, or, or as a public member, I can't tell what's happened. Is there follow through audit? Are things been changed? Do you need these records? Is there prosecution? I mean, you can't tell, and that's why I'm concerned about that. On item number eight, I'm concerned because of the age of the records, 1902 to 1917. They shouldn't even be in here. They should go through the Historical Records Committee, let the archivists look at them. At them. I go through uh, the, the uh, archival records of the city, and I scan as much old information as I can, especially in the area of parks, and there's very little. And to see journals like this be destroyed, they should be pulled. They shouldn't be approved, and then, and then later pulled, because that's what happened to the water records, and they were destroyed. They should be pulled at this point and go through a new policy, a new procedure. I'm also concerned about the Echo Park Lake rehabilitation records from the 80s. As you know, it's a propo item. It's a very expensive item. Everything goes on the backs of the taxpayers for paying this. Does Bureau of Engineering need that? I sit in meetings. I hear they don't know what things are until they open it up, rip it open, and then it's always more expensive than they thought. So I think there needs to be some care when it comes from this department as to, and other departments need to play in, as to if these records are, are necessary at this point. So I have three different arenas here. So I would like to see these pulled, not put through, not on the 60-day notice yet, until these questions can be answered. Again, we're, as, as a person who lives in a historic area, we're looking for economic development out of these historical records. It can produce income for us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here to comment on items? 5 through 11. Items 5 through 11 are open for public comment at this time. Seeing and hearing no more public comment on items 5 through 11, public comment is now closed. Um, with that, it will be a minority recommendation of this committee to approve items 5 through 11. We next go uh, to items 12 through 22. Items 12 through 22 are reports from the General Services Department, the Municipal Facilities Committee regarding lease agreements. Okay. Good afternoon, Lourdes Owen from Asset Management General Services. I, item 12 is approval to amend the lease to provide a rent credit for repairs performed by uh, California PETA in space nine due to water damage to the uh, premises. Okay. All right. Is there any corrections or anything that you want to add? Everything's fine as far as the language submitted? The language submitted is, is okay, okay no as it is. All right. Okay. Is there anybody here to make public comment on items 12 through 22? Or on items 12 through 22? I do not have any public comment cards on 12 through 22. Um, with that, we'll close public comment on items 12 through 22. And uh, the recommendation of this committee will be to approve uh, items 12 through 22. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number 23, we're now on item number 23. Item number 23 is a motion, Perry Parks Garcetti Han Krul, relative to recommendations for honoring the memory of Officer Simmons in a suitable fashion. Okay. Is anybody here uh, from the department to explain where we're looking to put this? Good afternoon. Tom Brennan, I'm the commanding officer of LAPD's Facilities Management Division. In addition to this motion that has been presented today, there was a communication from the mayor's office to the Board of Police Commissioners uh, requesting that the commission evaluate naming a new facility that we are, or, uh, actually, remodeled facility that we're looking at housing the Metropolitan Division at in honor of Officer Simmons. And at this point in time, that's being considered by the Board of Police Commissioners, and it will be, will be a report coming forward from the Board of Police Commissioners on that matter. Okay. And I think that they're going to, Board of Police Commissioners has been asked to take this up on the 25th of March, which is next week. I believe so. Okay. Good. All right. Um, 
So with that, what we'll do, <coughs> um, I don't see any public comment cards on this one. Anybody here to make public comment on item 23? Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number three is now closed. So we'll continue this item until the uh, Board of Police Commissioners has taken action on the mayor's request and has submitted the matter uh, and wait for them to transmit the matter to the city council so we can go ahead and move this item forward and approve it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. We we'll move to item number 24. Number 24 is a motion, Alarcon Cardenas, relative to the feasibility of constructing a library on San Fernando Mission Road in Brand Park. Okay. Is anybody here to make comment on item number 24? Okay. Councilmember Alarcon's office is silent. Um, looks pretty straightforward. Is anybody here to make a public comment on item number 24? Public comment? Public comment is open on item 24, seen and hearing none. Public comment is closed on item 24. Um, we'll move uh, to approve this item uh, and approve it and move it forward, but also amend the instructions to include GSD and BOE in the report back, which uh, we'll get in 30 days. Okay. We now I move. Item number 25 is a report from the Department of Transportation relative to the development and implementation of a communication plan that provides real-time information to commuters. Good afternoon, Varej Chiroyan, Transportation Department. Uh, the motion instructed DOT to look into ways that the uh, city's uh, ATSAC system is used to, in a similar fashion, to uh, provide traveler information uh, to the public, uh, similar to the one that's established in the Bay Area. Uh, um, in other words, uh, establish a 511 traveler information system. Um, so uh, the department has been working uh, for a s uh, period of time now with, the, with our counterparts at the MTA. Uh, the MTA has uh, established uh, a lead on in this on this uh, uh, item because it it is a regional uh, issue to provide travel information not just within the city of Los Angeles but throughout the region, and um, uh, just uh, recently, uh, actually subsequent to this item being heard at T committee back in uh, February four, uh, the MTA board uh, did approve a contract with a consultant. Uh, to establish a 511 system for the Los Angeles area. And uh, within six months, we should have uh, uh, some results out of that contract, and that will establish, as phase one, will establish travel information system that can provide uh, freeway information, transit information, um, automated route uh, selection based on real-time uh, congestion data uh, and real-time transit data. Uh, and right chair information. Okay. Has uh, DOT done any uh, upgrades to the ATSAC motorist website to make it more user friendly? Any changes been made recently? We, we are in the process of upgrading our website to make it G uh, GIS based. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, we have added several new links to it specifically for special events for street closures um, we are running almost um, uh, real time in that if um, yesterday we had st patrick's uh, uh, parade that was posted on the website uh, first street bridge closure that was posted on the website so that we try to keep up to date with major events uh, that uh, the public can use uh, uh, to uh, plan their their trips okay um, when it comes to congestion data from the ATSAC system um, to the private sector, uh, we're using the MTA's RITS network? That's correct. Okay. Um, is it your understanding that you still need council uh, authorization even though it's, you're doing this at no cost? Well, the, um, we need to, um, if we were to uh, provide the travel or uh, ATSAC information to the public, like, like uh, Caltrans does for the freeway and the MTA does for transit, we need to uh, authorize the MTA to uh, give the travel information to the private sector. Now, the MTA is not generating revenue out of, uh, out of this process right now. 
but sometime in the future, should they decide to generate revenue, then they will have to come back to the agencies and ask them what the, what the plan is and, and if the agencies wants to charge for its data. So right now, do we have an MOA with MTA on this? Oh, we have uh, uh, an MOU with the MTA uh, that's being uh, negotiated, uh, but that's only to provide the information. There is no mention of uh, charging for the data because they are not charging for the data. Okay. And uh, the MTA staff feels that you know, if we insert any language relative to charge, then that issue will have to go to the full board because that is a policy issue. And since there is no talk of that at this time, they, there's no, they, they don't feel that they need to go to the board at this point. So LADOT is going to continue to be on Metro's 511 working group? Once it's established, uh, yes, on the working group, yes, and and uh, we're very uh, active participant in that, and and really nothing will will happen through the um, the 511 system without the participation of of uh, the city and and DOT. And when is it anticipated that phase three is going to be completed? Um, I'm not sure phase three, I, I would say within a year. Uh, phase one is about six months and then phase two will add uh, more like weather, uh, weather, uh, uh, weather uh, uh, conditions, uh, information from Port of LA and Long Beach and maybe the airport. Um, but uh, phase three, uh, I think it all depends on how phase one goes and, um, and before phase, uh, proceeded to phase two and three. Now, one thing that we have said in the report that um, we will try to include the ATSAC data uh, or the city's data in phase one. We don't see any reason why that cannot be accomplished. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, is there anybody here to uh, comment on item number 25? We're on item number 25. Public comment is now open. I do not have any public comment cards on item 25. Seeing and hearing none, public comment is now closed on item 25. With that, this committee will instruct DOT to work with ITA and, and LA DOT on this matter and report back uh, in 45 days. And uh, it'll be a recommendation of this committee to approve the item. Okay. Item 26. Item number 26 is a motion, Han Garcetti relative to reporting on steps the city can take to protect cell phone customers from fraudulent text messaging services. Good afternoon. Mark Wolf with ITA. This report is in response to the motion from Councilmember Hahn and Garcetti requesting ITA to investigate what steps the City of Los Angeles can take to protect cell phone users from fraudulent text messaging services, including support for legislation to require that cell phone companies alert customers whenever a new external fee is added to their bill. The Los Angeles Times recently published an article detailing a text messaging scam being perpetrated where the customers were unaware that new charges or new services were being added to their, their phone bill and it was being done without necessarily the consent of the cell phone um, owner and essentially the website for these types of services would allow individuals to sign someone up without putting any identification information in other than just a cell phone number which anyone can do not just the owner of that cell phone and even with increased efforts of cell phone of the cell phone industry to self-regulate this type of fraud such fraudulent practices will likely continue to increase and due to the multitude of line items on a typical person's cell phone bill, it's difficult for customers and oftentimes they don't realize that new charges are being added like this for several months. And so ITA is recommending that, this, that we can provide information and web links to ex existing federal resources which provide warning information about these fraudulent activities and we can do this with links to the city's website. Second, ITA can work with the city attorney's office on the possibility of using existing consumer service protection laws to deter these activities or potentially create additional local ordinances if necessary. Third, we can support legislation at the state and federal level such as requiring cell phone companies to alert customers of new external fees on their bill Next, we can also work with the California PUC 
and FCC to encourage them to take steps necessary to ban all fraudulent practices, including banning daily alert text companies from engaging in these types of activities illegally. And next, we can also urge the California Attorney General to look into the billing safeguards regarding third-party billings employed by cell phone providers. Last, for your consideration, is a suggestion to invite cell phone providers to attend a future ITGS meeting to explain what safeguards are currently in place to deal with these types of third-party billings. Okay. So those are the recommendations the department came up with? Yes. Okay. Just want to clarify two things. Um, who regulates cell phones? What level of government regulates the cell phones? FCC, I believe? FCC. The city that, attorney is also here. Yeah, I think so. It's the feds. Yeah. So basically, what we're relegated to is just trying to help uh, people with awareness, uh, put links on our websites, et cetera, things of that nature. Um, in addition to that, did you say that? that we're expecting the industry to self-regulate on this? Well, what I, what I was suggesting that even though the, the cell phone industry is in effect putting in place various self um, safeguards themselves to try and prevent these types of um, fraudulent activities from occurring, um, it's not to say that they're going to be effective in actually uh, setting up proactive measures to notify customers of, of these potential problems. Mm -hmm. Are these cell phone companies, are they for profit or not for profit? They're definitely for profit. So basically they would have to look into uh, what it takes to actually implement these things. In some cases it may actually cost money, et cetera, for them to put these things in place. I think that's a correct assumption. Okay. So hopefully they will self-regulate and, and promote some good practices and implement them whether they're at cost or not. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, okay. We're on item number 26. Is there anybody here for public comment on item number 26? Anybody from the industry want to talk about the self-regulation they're going to do? Seeing and hearing none. Um, with that, public comment on item 26 is now closed. Um, so we'll uh, take the recommendations of the ITA uh, department. Thank you very much you. for those recommendations. And uh, this item, uh, we'll move to approve this item. Thank you. We've already done item 27, items 28, 29, and 30. We now move to item number 31. Item number 31 is a motion, Alarcon Gruel smith et al., relative to instructing the Chief Legislative Analyst to provide a report on the California Utilities Commission proposal for an 818 area code split. Mandana Khatib Shahidi reporting for the CLA's office. Uh, in 2007, the California Public Utilities Commission announced that there would be a shortage of available phone numbers for the 818 area code and subsequently requested that the North American Numbering Plan Administration um, hold an area code change planning meeting for the 818 area code. This meeting was held on June 14, 2007, and uh, the result was that the telecommunications industry offered two different alternatives, an area code split or an area code overlay. In October 2007, the CPUC hosted a series of public participation meetings, and on October 24, 2007, Councilmember Wendy Gruel submitted a letter on behalf of uh, Council District 2 um, to vote for the overlay option, and her le letter stated that the CPUC should justify whether this is, in fact, the appropriate time for an area code change, and the CPUC should provide um, sufficient information to its residents um, prior to implementing either an overlay or a split. And um, the motion also instructs our office, the CLA's office, to report back on the various options and include the fiscal impact on businesses and residents of the San Fernando Valley. So at this time, I'd like to recommend that we continue the motion and amend the instructions to include ITA and CAO in the report back. Okay, so those are your recommendations. Is there anybody to, here to speak on item number 31? Item number 31 is open for public comment. 
Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item 31 is now closed. Um, did, are you familiar with the fact that apparently a representative of the CPUC stated that the change in area code is not a function of shortage in actual numbers, it is a shortage of numbers in a specific geographic area? Yes, that, did that they delineate what they meant by that. They mean that it's, uh, to the best of my understanding, I don't have too much information on this right now. But to the best of my understanding, it's the actual shortage has to do with the prefixes, which are the first three numbers of the telephone number, not the whole telephone number itself. Um, and uh, we did make contact with a representative, but we weren't able to get enough information, so we're due to hear back from them sometime next week. Okay, can you also, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna take your recommendations, including ITA and CO on a report back in 30 days, but in addition to that, can you find out if they're still, using, when I was in the legislature, it was explained to me by the CPUC that regardless of large or small uh, telephone companies, when someone wanted an allotment of phone numbers assigned to them so that they can give to their potential customers, that they were giving allotments out in 10,000. So if someone were get, was given an allotment of 10,000 and they used 2,100 or 3,200 or what have you, those phone numbers were dead uh, for use because that particular provider didn't need them, but they were allotted to them so they just sat there. And that was a contributing factor to all the area code splits and all the actions that took place okay. over the last 20 years. Sure, we'll include that. So if we could find out if they're still using that practice, hopefully they've corrected it because they did talk about correcting it. Okay, so with that, we'll continue the motion and uh, uh, amend the instructions to include the IT and CAO to report back in 30 days and that additional matter to report back. Thank you. We now move to item number 32. 32 is a motion, Gruel Smith, relative to instructing the Department of General Services to report on the feasibility of using integrated pest management for all city facilities. What's an integrated pest management? Well, we're going to try to explain that. Are those where they let the cats run around and eat the rodents or what? Integrated pest management, yeah, feral cats, that's one solution. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that one. Uh, my name is Dan Easton. I'm the Director of Building Maintenance with the General Services Department. And uh, as the council had requested, uh, or the committee requested, we're reporting back on the feasibility of using the IPM uh, measures in all city facilities. <coughs> Uh, we can't speak for all city facilities. We do not maintain all city facilities, but I can speak to the ones GSD maintains. Uh, GSD, currently we implement uh, limited IPM measures in city facilities. Uh, we use toxic and non-toxic means of pest control. The uh, non-toxic includes glue traps and stuff like that for taking care of uh, right, uh, mice and rats. Also, we use uh, grapeseed extracts for pigeon abatement. That's a non-toxic solution to getting rid of pigeons. How do you get rid of them? Grape seed extract. It's just a grape seed mist that we spray out into an area and it aggravates the sensories of the pigeons so it uh, clears them away from an area. It's marginally successful. Nothing really gets rid of them forever, I don't think. They just keep coming back. Okay. Uh, We've also, we use 30% uh, of the chemicals that we use, we use our uh, contract vendors to take and provide pest control in many city buildings. 30% uh, of the chemicals that they use are uh, low toxicity. Uh, the others are, well, there's some toxicity with those. We do provide services on a scheduled and an as-needed basis. Uh, one of the processes that we can put in place is to move away from scheduled uh, services that may be a little bit more than is necessary and go to just strictly as needed services in a lot of city facilities. So that's one of the things that we're looking at doing, seeing if we can move more away from scheduled services and go only to the as needed services. So on an as needed services basis, if we were to move toward that, then that means a little bit more education would have to take place so that people know who to call when they feel they need to call, correct? That's correct. All right. And we can also save some money by doing that. And who would be the, who would be the most likely individuals in in city facilities if they were going to, who would be the point person? Because unfortunately, if you have a facility where hundreds of people, if not thousands of people work there, and they see a problem, they may go to the person at the front desk and tell them, and that person does, okay, thank you for letting right. me know. But 
I can't do anything about it. Who would be the likely individual on our city facilities that would actually say, okay, that's my job, I'm gonna pick up the phone and call them to come over and take care of it? Well, within each uh, facility, LAPD, LAFD, and the library department already have uh, facilities management groups. And all of their branch libraries, basically any complaints they get, uh, the fire stations, the police stations, they call their facilities management groups, which then contacts uh, GSD. It's the multi-use buildings that are the challenge for GSD, like City Hall. Uh, we do have a maintenance number that they can call for services. We also have on our website a link to our uh, building management system, which you can actually get in and put a request directly into the, uh, to the building maintenance division within general services, and we can respond that way. We can do a little bit more, I think, to maybe educate all the uh, city departments that that's available to them. Okay. All right. Um, now, if you're talking about implementing this IPM uh, across the board, what's the anticipated time frame or cost? Have you estimated that? Well, you know, IPM is a, uh, no, we've not. And IPM, there is no standard that says this is IPM and anything else is not. You know, it's a total look at everything that you do to control pests. And it's basically minimizing to the greatest degree possible the use of uh, poisons and all. Uh, so for us to say that to go fully IPM where there are no poisons in any of the uh, locations within the city, uh, we have not really studied it to that degree where we think that's a feasibility at this point in time. Uh, just don't know that we can get there. We're always going to need poisons, I think, for some of the more challenging tasks where we really have, you know, serious infestation of pests. We don't have a lot of those, but when we do, we need the, uh, the poisons and all to handle that. Um. I know we would like to, you'd like to hear us say today that we, uh, we can go to a completely integrated pest management process, but I, I think we do have that in place. We, uh, it's an as needed solution that we have. How many facilities are you talking about roughly? Roughly about uh, 867 facilities, 860 facilities. When we look at all the sanitation yards, street service yards, police and fire, libraries. So easier said than done. Some are buildings, some are more yards, some, so they, they run the whole gamut of what the character or the nature of that facility looks like or the functionality of it or the, the occupation of it, et cetera. So it runs the gamut. It's every building. Not every building is different, but everything you can imagine, we probably have that kind of facility that you have to manage the pest control on that, correct? That's right. And, and there's a different approach for almost every you know, situation. All right. Anybody here to speak on item number 32? Item number 32, public comment is open. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item 32 is now closed. With that, um, uh, we'll move to recommend approval of this item. Thank you. Item number 33, thank you. Item number 33 is a report from the Chief Legislative Analyst in response to motion Cardinus Wesson relative to expediting the processing of surplus equipment donations. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, Lynn Ozawa from the CLA's office. We're reporting in response to the motion Cardinus Wesson um, regarding a surplus equipment donation um, with concerns about how long uh, of a period is needed in order to develop and execute the agreements between the city and the recipients of the pr surplus equipment. And you requested us to report back on ways that we might be able to streamline this process. Um, we've provided a report dated March 3rd, 2008, um, which outlines the donation process Stella Charter Middle School, I believe, was of concern uh, because there was a donation of 50 surplus computers to that school, and it took a very long time. So you wanted us to look into that. Uh, what happened in that particular case was that after the motion was introduced, there were some changes to the city's financial policies on donation of surplus equipment which precluded at that time from the city making donations to 
um, any organization that wasn't a nonprofit specifically established to service the city of Los Angeles. So there were there were a number of months in between when the motion was introduced to having the financial policies amended to allow donations of surplus computer equipment or other equipment that the city would basically pay more to get rid of rather than donating to a worthy organization whether it be nonprofit or profit making. So the rules, um, the policies have been changed uh, but that is the major reason that Stella Middle School, uh, Charter Middle School took um, an inordinate amount of time. And it finally got resolved? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, currently, the city attorney has every contract in the city on, on arrives to their desk. Um, is there any other uh, office, such as the clerk's office or any other entity that I could actually process them? Um, other offices do become involved in terms of actually getting the signatures, getting the uh, executed contracts filed with the city clerk. However, um, there really isn't a substitute that I'm aware of for the city attorney's um, expertise in dra drafting those contracts. Hi, Ted Jordan from the city attorney's office. Uh, Lynn's correct. I mean, ultimately, the document that is needed to have the donation go through is a contract. So whether another department prepares that, ultimately we're going to need to review and approve that contract. In a number of instances, depending on the nature of the equipment being donated, we will work with the other departments to hammer out certain details. For example, on certain of the vehicle donations, we need to have a discussion with the departments about what equipment will be in that vehicle. Is there going to be a light bar on top of the ambulance? That was one that had come up. Once we get all of those details work out, we incorporate everything we need to do in the contract. But we, you know, treat all of these as an, as important donations because we recognize that they're going to nonprofits or schools or groups of that sort. And so we do them as quickly as we can. Okay, as quickly as you can. As quickly as we can. Okay, good. Um, all right. Is there anybody here to make public comment on item number thirty-three? Oh, Mr. Chair, we do have one slight revision we'd like to make to our report. It's a clarification. On attachment one, we have a description of the surplus equipment process. And on step number two, uh, we would like to clarify that uh, GSD determines if surplus equipment is available. However, ITA determines whether or not there is surplus computer equipment available. Okay. All right. And I'll leave that information with the uh, clerk. Yes. All right. Yes, that, that's appropriate. Thank you. Um, anybody here to make public comment on item number 33? Uh, seeing and hearing none, public comment on item 33 is now closed. With that, we will um, uh, move to approve the recommendations of the CLA report with the amendment of their recommendation that was just stated regarding the computers and ITA approval. Okay. Thank you. We now move to item number 34. Number 34 is a report from the City Administrative Officer relative to a proposed amendment to the Broxton Lot Group Memorandum of Understanding with the Department of General Services to include additional parking facilities. Uh, Mr. Chair, Jason with the CEO's office. Uh, it's a CEO report and the recommendation is to authorize the General Manager of DOT to amend a current MOU with General Services to include parking management services at eight additional lots. Uh, the compensation for services private will increase by $861,000. There is no general fund impact and the funding is currently available. Okay. Uh, we have members from the departments if you have any questions. Okay. Anything other than concurring with that, those statements? Um, no. Just to add that uh, revenue is up 23% since last July. So. Really? Yes, it is. You didn't tell us? <laughs> of 23 percent. Well, that's good news. From when uh, the, they were operated by private contractors. So GSD is pretty proud of that. And we thank DOT for the opportunity. Wonderful. So by bringing them in-house, uh, we've actually been able to realize. Uh, an right. Issue. And we also have no, obviously, we have no revenue sharing 
um, arrangement in this contract because we can't share the revenue. It all goes straight back to the, to the uh, SPRF. Okay. All right. But it's always good news to see that we have more to work with wherever the money uh, ends up being segregated. Okay. Is anybody here to make co public comment on item number 34? Item 34, public comment is open. Public comment is now closed. With that, uh, we concur with the Transportation Committee's recommendations. And thank you for the good news. Thank, thank you. you. Any more items on the agenda? No? We are now open for general public comment. Is anybody here for general public comment to this committee? Um, general public comment is now open. Seeing and hearing none. General public comment is now closed. With that, this committee is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.